thank you for joining us today, joining us for today's online talk, which will be starting shortly at 3 p.m. For those of you who are here early, thank you for waiting patiently. While you're waiting, we would like to share a short video from the firm. I founded the firm in September 1985 with the vision of seeking truth and justice for our clients and not just winning their cases. Over the years, the team has achieved many significant milestones. We are today recognized by the Legal 500, Asia Law Profiles and Asian Legal Business as a recommended firm in various practice areas. While we have embraced technology to make our services efficient and responsive, we continue to grow on the bedrock of meticulous preparation and hard work, for which there is really no substitute. As legal practice becomes increasingly international, we keep ourselves ahead of the curve with our relationship with lawyers from around the world. Our firm is a founding member of the Legal Lawyers, a growing international network of law firms in 20 Asian and European countries. We believe in partnering with our clients to protect and grow their business. We achieve this by holding firm to our values of integrity and justice while giving our best to deliver effective and efficient solutions. Instead of just legal services, we focus on developing great working relationships based on understanding and respect. The firm invests in its team and emphasizes professional development. We are keen to share our knowledge and publish our articles on our website. And we also give back with our corporate social responsibility activities. We cultivate a passion for the law and enjoy what we do. This brings out the best in us for our clients today and tomorrow. We regularly advise foreign clients, including many Chinese investors, and have a ready appreciation for different ways of doing business. In corporate matters, we offer relevant and commercial solutions, often raising issues that clients may or may not have realized before. In negotiations, we believe in facilitating win-win outcomes. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's online talk entitled Partnership Dissolution and Distribution of Partnership Assets. My name is Ryan Cheong. I am I am an pupil in chambers with Marvin Guan and Associates and I will be your moderator for today's session. Before we start today's talk, let me introduce the firm and what we do. Marvin Guan and Associates is a mid-sized law firm that was founded in 1985 by Dato Ma Wing Kwai. Our ABLE team today comprises of 22 lawyers and a support team of 19. Dato Ma is today a consultant with the firm following his retirement from the Court of Appeal in, 19, in 2015. The firm continues its tradition today of working primarily with small, medium enterprises, family businesses, and individuals. We are a full service law firm with a corporate department, a dispute resolution department, a dedicated employment and industrial relations team, and a department focused on servicing the needs of individuals and families. Our practice groups indicate some of our focus areas, which are supported by talents from both our corporate and dispute resolution teams. Today's talk is part of MWKA's online talk series. By way of a background, we have been organizing monthly lunch talks at our office since 2013, some of which were even broadcasted live. But with the unexpected pandemic, we have moved online with our objective of sharing knowledge, raising awareness and encouraging networking for clients, potential clients and in-house counsel. This is our 28th talk in our online talk series, which and this talk is attended today by at least 27 participants, and we are expecting 65 people who have registered. Please visit our website at mawingkwai.com for more information, to read our articles, and to sign up for upcoming talks. Before I continue, please be reminded that this talk does not constitute legal service. 
legal advice in the event you require specific legal advice to your matter, please contact us for a complimentary legal consultation. Details will be given at the end of this talk. We have two speakers for today. First, Mr. Gan Chongche Wu. We have two speakers for today. Mr. Gan Chongche will be speaking first and followed by Ms. Diana Che. Uh, allow me to introduce Mr. Gan Chongche. He is a partner in our dispute resolution department. He holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of London and a Master's in the International Economic Law from the East China University of Political Science and Law. He was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2009 and his main areas of practice are general litigation, will writing, probate, and administration. Our other speaker for today is a senior associate in our dispute resolution and employment department. Ms. Diana holds a Bachelor of Laws from the University of Malaya and was admitted to the Malaysian Bar in 2014. Ms. Diana is also a certified mediator with the Bar Council and is a HRDF certified trainer. Ms. Diana's main areas of practice include mediation, corporate and commercial litigation, employment, and industrial relations advisory and litigation. We will conclude today's talk with a Q&A session. Our speakers will target to complete their presentation by 4 p.m., 3.45 p.m., and then take your questions. We have a lot of good content to cover today, and our speakers are likely to, be, to extend beyond 3.45. So please stay with us while you can. Over to you, Diana. Thank you, Ryan. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Diana, and I'll be covering three topics today, which are the types of partnership in Malaysia, um, the definition of partnership under the Partnership Act 1961, and the solution of partnership under the Partnership Act 1961. There are two types of partnership in Malaysia generally. Um, the first one being the partnership uh, under the Partnership Act 1961. We also um, call this as the pa uh, conventional partnership. And um, the other type of partnership is the Limited Liability Partnership or LLP under the Limited Liability Partnership Act. Definition of partnership under the Partnership Act. Section 3.2 of the Partnership Act excludes the following forms of company or association which would otherwise fall within the definition. So Section 3.2 of the Partnership Act states that um, companies incorporated under the Companies Act 1965, that was the old Act, um, the new Act, um, which is Companies Act uh, 2016, cooperatives, um, charitable societies, uh, so, um, associations, and clubs, um, these are not partnership under the Partnership Act 1961. Um, the High Court in the case of Tam Kim Pai and also in the case of Tradimas Ramberhat um, distilled three essential ingredients from the definition of partnership in Section um, 3, Subsection 1 of the Partnership Act. So the court in these two cases says that a partnership um, to, to, define, to, to determine whether there's a partnership or not, there must be a business. Um, the partnership is carried out in common between the partners and with a view to making profit. So these are the three essential ingredients from the definition of partnership. In order to determine whether there's a partnership between parties, um, the court will look at the intention of parties um, based on the facts and circumstances of the case. So in the case of direct scope Schramber Hart, um, uh, the court says that it is incumbent on the court to ascertain the intention of parties based on the whole facts of the case and the contract they had made in order to decide whether there's a partnership relationship between the three consortium members in the, in this, in the instance case. The court also say that um, the partner's intention can be reasonably inferred from the facts and circumstances surrounding the case. So we look at intention of parties. In the case of Malaysian International Trading Corporation, Japan's Rambert Hart, and Bantini, SBA, and others. The High Court in this case was of the considered view that the true nature of the unincorporated joint venture in question was a partnership. 
The partners came together for the single and common business of securing the project and to profit from such a business. So even though there's a distinction between um, joint venture and a partnership, um, the consideration of the intention of the parties at the material time under the context of Section um, 3 of the Partnership Act is equally applicable to a joint venture, which are common arrangements um, in any trade, occupation or profession. In this case, Ratna Amal and Naden, Tan Chao Su, the Federal Court held that the object of the agreement between the parties was to form a so-called syndicate for the purpose of selling condensed milk. The relationship constituted between the, the partners, the court said that it was no doubt essentially one of partnership. So the use of the term syndicate to describe um, parties' relationship does not preclude um, the existence of a partnership in this case. Um, the court says that the question is whether um, the parties are carrying on a business for a view of, prof uh, for a view of uh, profit. <coughs> Me. Um, next, um, what will happen if there is no partnership agreement between the partners? So we look at the case of Ao Yong Wai Chu and Arif Trading Shramber Hat and another. So in this case, the High Court um, um, says that um, a partnership mm -hmm. exists between the defendants um, from, uh, as found from all the evidence. To find the existence of a partnership, the court must find the real intention of parties in dispute or involved. Again, the court looked into intention of parties. And the court said that the in real intention is not necessarily the expressed intention of the parties, so that even if the parties express that they are partners, the court may decide to the contrary after the court considers all relevant facts taken together. So the mere fact that there was no written partnership agreement um, did not itself mean that there is no partnership um, between the partners. It is also important to note that um, a partnership does not have a legal personality and um, this is discussed in the case of Alagapa Chetia and Colosseum Cafe and also the case of Madan Lao and Anada and Ho Sui So in these two cases, um, first the Court of Appeal in the case of Alagapa Chetia um, help that a partnership has no legal personality, distinct and separate from the natural personalities of the individual, individual partners. Hence, um, the court held that the, a partnership cannot hold a tenancy. And um, in the case of Madan Lal and Nada, um, the court also held that um, the partnership um, does not have a legal personality. So uh, a partnership, again, the court... Um, Help that the partnership can hold a tenancy and it can't be sued uh, uh, as a party in court or any uh, tribunal. Next, we look at um, the solution of partnership under the Partnership Act 1961. Under the uh, Partnership Act, there are four ways of uh, dissolution of partnership. The first one by way of expiration or notice. Um, the second one being um, dissolution by bankruptcy, death or charge, third one being dissolution by illegality of partnership, and the last one being the dissolution by the court. So we look at dissolution by expiration or notice. This is quite common, it's, it is a common way of uh, 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 dissolution of a partnership. So this is governed by section 34 of the Partnership Act. So section 34 states that Subject to any agreement between the partners, a partnership is dis um, a partnership is dissolved if there is a fixed term by the expiration of that term. Um, if entered into for a single adventure undertaking by the termination of that adventure or undertaking, and thirdly, if entered into for an undefined time, then by any partner giving notice to the other partner of his intention to dissolve the partnership. So under um, subsection two, uh, sub, uh, section 34, subsection 2, the court said that, um, sorry, the, um, the act states that the partnership is dissolved as from the date mentioned in the notice as the date of dissolution. 
or if no date is so mentioned as from the date of communication of that notice. So if a partner gives notice to the other partner of his intention to dissolve um, the partnership, then the partnership is dissolved from the date mentioned in the notice as the date of dissolution. If there's no such date mentioned, then it is from the date of the communication of that notice. The, um, here I would like to um, highlight um, two English cases. The first one being Mel and Mavin. In this case, the court held that if a partner gives notice to determine on a given date and the partner died before that date, then the partnership is dissolved by death. In Mackler and Dowling, the court said that if a partner died before receipt of notice signed by him, the partnership is dissolved by death. Next, we look at dissolution by bankruptcy, death or charge. So section 35 of the Partnership Act states that um, subject to any agreement between partners, every partnership is dissolved as regard all the partners by the death or bankruptcy of any partner. Subsection 2 said that a partnership may, at the option of the other partners, be dissolved if any partner suffers his share of the partnership property to be charged under this act for his separate debt. In the case of Lee Chu Yam Holdings, Chamber Hart and others, and Ku Yok Wa and others, the court held that an agreement made by the surviving partners after the death of a partner without the agreement of the deceased partner will not bind the deceased partner, nor will it make the partnership a continuing partnership. On the death of any partner, a partnership stands dissolved unless there is evidence that the partners had agreed otherwise. The onus is on the defendants to prove not the existence of an agreement between the surviving partners, but the existence of an agreement between all the partners, including the deceased partner. So in other words, um, the court said that the agreement made between partners must have been made before the death of any partner. Next, we look at dissolution by illegality of partnership. Section 36 of the Partnership Act states that a partnership is in every case dissolved by the happening of any event which makes it unlawful for the business of the firm to be carried on or for the members of the firm to carry it on in partnership. For example, if two individuals enter into a partnership agreement to form a partnership for the purpose of selling and purchasing of marijuana. So this itself is, is, is illegal. And if there's a um, dispute, the court will determine that the, uh, the court will dissolve the partnership under Section 36 of the Partnership Act because it is unlawful um, to, to, to sell and to purchase uh, marijuana in Malaysia. Um, another example, um, is a partnership form to trade protective uh, wildlife. So this kind of um, partnership agreement will be held um, unlawful and will be dissolved um, under Section 36. The last one um, would be dissolution by the court. So Section 37 of the Partnership Act says that on application by a partner, the court may decree a dissolution of the partnership in any of the following cases. So the first one being if the partner is found lunatic or to be of permanently unsound mind, then uh, the court may decree a dissolution of the partnership. The next one, um, if any of the partner is permanently incapable of performing his part of the partnership um, contract. Subsection C says that if any partner guilty of such conduct, as in the opinion of the court, regard being had to the nature of the business is calculated to affect prejudicially the carrying on of the business. <clears throat> I've cited a, uh, an English case, um, Clifford and Teams, where the House of Lords upheld a dissolution of partnership between dental practitioners um, because one dental practitioner um, was found guilty on the ground of professional misconduct. Subsection D said that 
when a partner willfully or persistently commits a breach of the partnership agreement and it is not reasonably practical for the other partner or partners to carry on the business in partnership with him. So in such situation, the court may dissolve the partnership. This is um, discussed in the case of Muhammad Ghazali Ahmad Nasruddin and Chok Kai Kwang and others. In this case, the court found the partnership should be dissolved due to breaches of the partnership agreement. So just um, committed by one of the partner, um, and I've listed a few here. Um, um, based on evidence, the court found that the first defendant had decided on the annual increment and bonus for the staff without the involvement of the plaintiff. So this is in breach of the partnership agreement entered between the partners. Um, the second one, the first defendant attempt to vary the partnership agreement. The first defendant repeated uh, refusal to meet the plaintiff. And the court also found that the first defendant speaking negatively about the plaintiff to the staff. So um, hence, the court found that the partnership should be dissolved. Subsection E says that when the business of the partnership can only be carried on at a loss, the court may help or may dissolve um, the partnership. And last but not least, if the court render it just and equitable that the partnership should be dissolved. So in the case of um, Karen Isabel um, Wilfred and Diana Sheila Vasantan, sorry, in this case, the court allowed the plaintiff's application for a dissolution of the partnership pursuant to Section 37F on the ground that there had been an irretrievable uh, it irretrievable breakdown of the relationship between the parties and that the animosity between the parties was to such an extent that it precluded all reasonable hope of reconciliation and friendly cooperation. So in this case, the court found that um, the partners were not in talking terms. Um, all communications were done by way of emails and letters um, and uh, the partners um, um, had constantly um, um, argued um, and in disagreements in many, many um, um, factors uh, uh, or matters in the uh, uh, partnership. So the court in this case um, allowed the plaintiff's application for a dissolution of the partnership. Next, um, my colleague Guy will talk on the distribution of partnership assets upon dissolution of partnership. Over to you, Gan. Yes, thank you, Diana. Thank you, everyone, for attending to uh, today's talk. And thank you, Diana. Also, thank you to Ryan uh, for hosting this talk. I will continue uh, today's talk with this topic, uh, distribution of partnership assets upon dissolution of partnership. So, uh, Section 41 of the Partnership Act provides for uh, the rights of partner as to application of the partnership uh, property. If I may just read, on the dissolution of the partnership, every partner is entitled as against the other partners in the firm and all persons claiming through them in respect of their interests as partners to have the property of the partnership applied in payment of the debts and liabilities of the firm and to have the surplus assets after such payment applied in payment of what may be due to the partners respectively and after deducting what may be due from them as partners to the firm. And for that purpose, any partner or his representative may on determination of the partnership apply to court to wind up the business and affairs of the firm. So in short, um, upon dissolution of the uh, partnership, uh, the partners can use then the assets of the partnership to pay off the debts first. So any surplus of the assets then only to be divided uh, among the partners according to their respective shareholding, either based on their uh, partnership agreement, or if there's no partnership agreement, then uh, based on the Partnership Act, it's 50-50. Uh, Next, Section 46 uh, of the Partnership Act provides for the rules for distribution of assets on final settlement of account. So in setting an account, 
So basically, uh, once everything has been wound up and in trying to, to distribute the assets, so what are the rules that, let's say the partners or even the receiver and manager has to consider uh, before distributing the surplus of the uh, assets? So if let's say uh, there is loss uh, based on 46 sub A, losses including losses and deficiencies of capital shall be paid first out of profits, next out of capital, and lastly by the partners. So if there are any losses, you have to use the profits to pay it off first, then the capital, and if not enough, then the partners, they individually have to bear. So there is a personal liability uh, on the partners. Next, on the assets of the firm, including the sums, if any contributed finance to make up losses or deficiencies of capital, uh, shall be applied in the following manner and order. So in paying the, so you shall pay off, the, the partners will have to pay off the debts and liabilities of the firms to persons who are not partners therein. So let's say if there are any creditors, you have to pay off the creditors first. Then next will be in paying to each partner relatively what is due from the firm to him for advances. So example, if I advance money to the firm, then uh, the firm will have to pay me back for the advances I have given to the firm. Next, in paying to each partner relatively what is due from the firm to him in respect of the capital. And so uh, after deducting uh, everything, then the ultimate residue uh, to be divided uh, according to the partner's proportion. Section 40 of the Partnership Act provides for uh, continuing authority of partners for purpose of winding up. So let's say even after the partnership has been dissolved, uh, the authority of each partner to bind the firm and the other rights and obligations of the partners continue notwithstanding the dissolution. So therefore, uh, this, section, this particular section means that even if the partnership has been dissolved, the partners has the right to uh, wind up the affairs of the partnership and to complete the transactions begun but unfinished. So doesn't mean that the partnership has been dissolved. Um, the partners then don't do anything. Let's say if you have uh, any outstanding stocks, then you can still deal with the, the stocks uh, as provided for under Section 40. So in TRA mining against Tian Hock Take, which is a federal court decision uh, spe specifically on Section 40, uh, where the court held that the dissolution is distinct from the winding up of a partnership business. Although the term dissolution implies termination, dissolution is actually the beginning of the process that ultimately terminates a partnership. So the federal court is decision in TRA mining is clear that uh, dissolution itself doesn't mean that the company uh, totally won up in that way. So it's only the beginning to the winding up of the partnership. So the court further held that under the section, which is section 40, even after dissolution of a partnership, the authority of each partner to bind the firm and the other rights and obligations of the partners continue not only for the purpose of winding up the affairs of the partnership, but also to complete the transaction begun but unfinished at the time of the dissolution. So there, there are definitely certain uh, circumstances where, um, let's say if the partnership is in respect of uh, maybe selling um, fruits, for example. So uh, the partnership or the partners, even though they have dissolved, they can continue selling their fruits and the uh, proceeds of sale then to be included into the partnership. So the, court further, uh, the federal court further held that the partnership is deemed to continue for those purposes and unsettled business or affairs of the partnership need to be settled and completed. So basically you cannot leave the uh, partnership uh, hanging even after dissolution. There must be a proper and complete uh, winding out of the business. Next is this case of Muhammad Ghazali Ahmad Nasruddin against Chok Kai Kwang, which, uh, which was mentioned by uh, Diana earlier on. Uh, in this case, which was handled by the firm, the plaintiff, which is a uh, Muhammad Ghazali filed an application for declaration that the partners of the partnership are entitled to the projects and the returns therefrom brought in by them 
respectively after the dissolution of the partnership pursuant to a, pursuant to a judgment of this court on 27 March 2017. So what happened was, uh, this is a firm of engineers by uh, Jake Ghazali and also uh, Mr. Chok Kai Kwang. So uh, judgment has been given and the court held that the partners are to, the assets of the partnership uh, in total in everything to be divided on a 50-50% uh, a ratio of 50-50. However, uh, Encik Ghazali then went on to apply, which is post the uh, judgment, uh, after, after trial, post judgment, file in an application for a declaration that uh, if the projects that were brought in by me, then it should belong to me and it shouldn't be distributed according to the 50-50 uh, ratio that was decided in the uh, judgment or decided in the after trial. So it has, as what I mentioned here, it's a key term of the judgment that this distribution of all assets and liabilities, including returns and surplus of the firm must be undertaken equally on a 50-50 ratio between the plaintiff and the first defendant. And that an appointment of a receiver and manager was also subsequently allowed in order to execute the distribution, which is the receiver and manager will then follow the judgment to allow the 50, 50 uh, to, to call in the assets and then to any, uh, any surplus to be divided on a 50 50 basis. So, uh, Justice Mohammad Nazlan, uh, which is the same judge that sat in the former Prime Minister's uh, 1MDB trial, which is in the criminal court, but he was previously in the civil court. So um, he held that it is true that the firm was declared to be dissolved from 23rd March 2016, which was in fact the date mutually agreed by the parties and that, and that the partnership had continued to operate at least until early 2018. But this does not change the order of the court person to a judgment in respect of the asset distribution. The fact that the parties continue to be in dispute with no signs of improvement in the relationship even now and arguing about the partnership generally and about the projects of the partnership which were brought in before and more so after the dissolution especially cannot be a valid premise to displace the judgment. Hence, uh, Justice Nazlan dismissed the application and also held that in this instant application before me, the plaintiff is not seeking to vary the existing judgment, but is also asking for another order to be issued and to be depart from the earlier decision on asset distribution. So the High Court was clear that once the uh, judgment has been given on the uh, asset distribution, which then uh, complied also with the uh, section, with the sections uh, provisions in the Partnership Act, whereby uh, whereby the court held that it's on a 50-50 uh, ratio, there shouldn't be any subsequent application to uh, vary the existing judgment. However, this case went on an, an appeal whereby uh, Encik Ghazali went on, filed an appeal against this case. Uh, the Court of Appeal overturned uh, the High Court's order and applied Section 40, which I've mentioned earlier on, Yes, section 40. So the Court of Appeal applied this section 40 on the continuing authority of partners for purpose of winding up. The Court of Appeal uh, held that the, held that the uh, parties are able to apply section 40 to basically tie up the loose ends and hence uh, allow the partners to, allow the declaration that the partners are able to uh, take their own uh, cases that they brought in and to manage it. So that's the case on uh, Ghazali against Chokai Kwang. That comes to the end of the, the talk. And we will take questions from uh, the floor. Uh, thank you, Diana and Gan, for the talk. We will now be taking Questions from the party, from the participants from Slido. If I could just move my. Um, so, what happens if partners are unable to agree in any form or way to dissipate partnership assets? So, if the partners are unable in any form or way to 
dissipate partnership assets. Um, usually one way is you, the partnership will then employ or appoint a receiver and manager. And this receiver and manager will be empowered, uh, the powers to, to deal with the partnership assets. In, in any event, if the receiver and the manager still is unable to determine how uh, to dispose the partnership assets per se, the receiver and manager has the power to apply to court and to get a necessary court order for the dispose for the dissipation or for disposing the partnership assets. Okay, thank you, Gan. Um, the next question is: Can I prevent a dissolution? Uh, Diana, do you want to take this? Yes. <clears throat> Thanks, Ryan. Um, can you prevent a dissolution? Um, I don't think so. You can prevent a dissolution um, unless it is uh, expressly stated in the partnership agreement. Otherwise, if there is a um, um, dispute between the partners um, and, uh, uh, and one of the partners apply to court to dissolve the um, partnership, the court will look into um, the facts and uh, circumstances of the case mm -hmm. and uh, decide whether or not the partnership should be dissolved. Thank you, Diana. Um, the next question we'll be taking on is what constitutes winding up the affairs of a partnership? Um, Gan, could you please take the floor? Yes, winding up of the affairs of the partnership, meaning basically bringing up the uh, partnership to a clean end. So whatever, whatever uh, debts or liabilities uh, the partnership actually incurred and you pay off everything, and whatever that surplus to be paid to the partners then paid off and then basically to bring the whole uh, partnership to an end. So that's called the winding up of the affairs of the partnership. Thank you, Gan. Um, our next question is, since the partnership does not have a separate legal entity, do all partners need to sign every documents regarding, regarding any transaction involving the partnership also, aka taking financing, can all partners assign some of the partners to represent the rest? This is um, question 1A and question 1B. Um, Diana, can you, can you take this please? Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, generally, um, partners are jointly and severally liable for the conduct of um, uh, the, partners, the other partners in the partnership. So if you have a partnership agreement to assign um, maybe one or two partners to sign um, documents um, regarding um, financial um, transactions, then um, the two partners will be signing on um, those documents. Um, but then in any, uh, if there's any um, um, dispute, um, then bear in mind that um, all partners are um, jointly and several liable for the conduct of the other partners. Okay, thank you, Diana. The next question we have is, after dissolution, can I still buy items using the partnership money if the profits earned was for the partners? Um, Gan, could you take this, please? Um, for this question, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, advise to do so because um, even after dissolution and you know that there are profits, but these profits would have to be used to pay off the debts and any losses first. So in the event, if you use off the monies, then what happens if it's not enough? Then it may also become an issue. And secondly, if after the dissolution and uh, let's say one of the partners start using the partnership money, it may also beca become a, a dispute later on because the, the other partners may then say that, uh, why are you using this money? Because the accounts has not been finalized and it may be seen as um, the partner taking away uh, uh, partnership money for his own uh, profit. So um, the answer is not advisable to do so. Thank you for your insight, Gan. Um, our next question is, 
since partnerships do not have a separate legal entity, any idea why it can hold, it can still hold assets, for example, vehicles and real estate? I believe this is a question for Diana. Um, I believe that um, partnership cannot hold um, asset. Um, assets are held under the name of the partners. So um, usually if uh, it is, usually it is held um, under the name of either one partner or um, if they are joint uh, partners, then um, in the partner's joint name. Okay, thank you, Diana. And the last question we have today is, are activities post-dissolution in the syndicate and a normal partnership the same. Diana, do you want to take this as well? Um, activities post this solution in a syndicate and a normal partnership. Um, I think we have to look into the um, facts and circumstances of the particular case and the intention of the parties. So if um, the syndicate is formed, um, with a view of making profit, then it is a partnership. Um, and uh, I don't quite get what are the activities post-dissolution here means. Um, so if it is a partnership, then we will follow um, the uh, steps uh, or ways to dissolve um, the partnership, um, just like a normal partnership under the Partnership Act. Or... Um, what it is agreed by the partners in the um, partnership agreement. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Diana. So um, that's all for the questions for today. Thank you, uh, Gan and Diana, for your insights. Before we conclude, I have a few announcements to make. First, firstly, please join us again for our upcoming talk on the 23rd of September, 2020. Um, the speakers will be by Sarah Kambali, a partner of our firm, and Anis Mohammad Sohaimi, a associate. The topic will be on preparing for the unexpected in WASIAT drafting. Secondly, please fill in our feedback form and tell us what you thought of our talk. The link to the form will be posted in the chat. To sign up for more MWKA online talks, please scan the QR code or go to mawengkwai.com slash talks dash signup.com. Thirdly, please follow all our social media accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook. Fourthly, if you would like to speak with our lawyers, we offer a complimentary 30-minute consultation over the phone or over video correspondence. Please fill in the form on our website. The link is posted in the chat box down below. Uh, to our guests, thank you for joining us today. We hope you found today's session interactive, useful, and informative. Thank you, everybody, and see you at our next talk. Thank you, everyone. Yes, thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm.